Arcus is an exciting organization. I'm very happy to share the story. Uh, when I joined Arcus last year, uh, we were five employees. We just talked 30, and we are going to be hitting 40 by the end of the quarter. So let me tell you a little bit about Arcus. We are an AI-driven market intelligence firm where we support Fortune 500 covering utilities, manufacturing, industrial, and many other sectors. Really, we've chosen to focus on one area, which is power and scale across all areas that touch it. So we're currently comprised of three business units. Last year, we amalgamated with Energy Stream. Energy Stream has been around for 25 years and is the largest, most granular power market database across North America. The uh, focus of today will be on power stream a little bit more. That is our predictive analytics tool. We are forecasting price, points in the peaks, and demand response, uh, supporting optimization. And then lastly, since we are uh, essentially mapping out every single asset that's online, the type of technology, the fuel source, we are able to speak to scope two emissions. Uh, so that is our carbon stream product line. Now, why do we care about the electrification and growing energy challenge? Well, industrialization is an old story. It's happening at a global level. Really, the developed nations have already you know, gone to use dirty fuels, but now we're seeing other nations ramping up their economic development, and electrification demand is growing. With this comes an increased carbon footprint. We have net zero goals, but we have a lot of countries, a lot of Businesses which are trying to do this, but it's increasing carbon emissions. The transition to sustainability. Well, we're seeing a lot of uh, essentially transition away from coal. We're seeing a lot of these coal plants either mothball or we're seeing them just shuttered completely. Uh, others are transitioning to natural gas. Renewables are a key part of the future, but what we're often seeing when the wind is down, the sun is not shining. Merit order on uh, power prices just spikes right up. In Alberta, the peak is $1,000 a megawatt hour. If you talk about Texas with ERCOT, it's 5000 We're often seeing the price spike up to these peaks. And what's happening? Businesses are no longer economic with their uh, business operations because the landscape's changed. So with this, as we're digitalizing, uh, digitalizing an energy strategy, we're providing foresight so that businesses can proactively avoid these elements. And then ultimately, this is, as I'm reiterating again and again, supporting net zero. Many of the uh, oil and gas companies here have a five-year electrification plan to clean up the uh, extraction and processing activities. Right now, some of them are running off diesel generators. These are filthy sources of power. But with this, as they electrify, they'll be pulling off the grid. This is putting more demand there. We're going to see more volatility. So the broader thesis is decreased intervals of volatility and higher severity. So with this, we provide a means for businesses to plan around these events so that they can not only optimize their production, but economics as well. We'll touch on a couple key points about Arcus as well that I think are very important. Overall, our mission is to build for, uh, reliable, scalable tool for energy cost management. But truly what I'm most proud about is our mission, and this is to democratize energy intelligence. Our founder was a power trader for 15 years, and he saw the specialized tools and knowledge that traders had, and he wanted to get this in the hands of your everyday business. And then ultimately of our values, what I want to highlight is our transparency. If we will be providing a forecast for the business to make a decision off of, they need to understand the parameters and boundaries that they can trust and believe in the model, and they have to believe in you. And you have to earn credibility, and you do that by demonstrating what the model's doing. You don't hide the numbers, you show what works, you show what doesn't work, so that your partner can gain faith in what you do. Diving into the tools a little bit more, you see Energy Stream, which is the definition of big data. We have over 3 million attributes with 6 billion rows of data. When we look at the market, we have the data. The next is PowerStream. This is a vertically integrated tool that lives within PowerStream, which is a broader or energy stream, which is a broader ecosystem. Uh, but then PowerStream, as I mentioned, is doing 
price forecast, a coincident peak forecast, and then supporting demand response, which is a revenue generating activity. And then lastly, carbon stream. And we'll dig into these a little more. Uh, but just to give a brief overview of our clients, we are working across several sectors. We have many Fortune 500s utilizing us, and we're supporting their business decisions. But what makes us different? Our domain expertise and power market focus. We have a team of 12 model developers. They either have a master's or doctorate in electrical engineering. Since then, we've trained them in data science. So when we talk about what is happening in power markets, these are individuals who understand the infrastructure. They've helped install it. They understand the policy. So when they're producing a quantitative model, they actually have the skills and knowledge to challenge that. And then additionally, we're staying in our lane. We understand what we're good at, and to scale, we're very much focusing on that niche, but we're trying to find partners who can bring our toolkit into a broader solution. Uh, next would be in-house development. You know, it's very easy to look external, to offshore. You know, there's a time and a place for certain things, but ultimately, if you want to have a collaborative ecosystem, we find that one of our core competencies, having our model developers and our software development team in one room. Uh, we're also vertically integrated. So by having Energy Stream, which is the power market database, our models sit on top of that. So if we've modeled Alberta, we can now transition to Ontario. We can transition to the East Coast of the US. All we do is take our models, point it at the new market, tie in our data streams, train, ensure it meets our commercial standards, and release. And then we're on to the next market. So this allows us to scale and pivot very quickly deploying across North America. We've also set up partnerships with the University of Calgary and the University of Texas Austin so that we bring in post-grad researchers to support our R&D. With this, it acts as a funnel for talent into our organization as well as supporting academic uh, development. And then lastly, cognitive diversity. There's many ways to solve the problem. We bring a lot of stubborn, hard-headed people to present that. And then from that adversity, we really stress test and find the best solution. But let's get into the nitty gritty so we can really tear apart the use case and understand some of the change management practices. So we're looking uh, at an energy stream dashboard and we're looking at the past year of Alberta power prices. A lot of volatility is caused, as I mentioned, from when renewables aren't available. Previously, uh, I think the average dollar per megawatt price for uh, the ASO in the uh, prior year was roughly $65. I'd like to take a quick poll of the room. Anyone have a guess for where it is this year? All right, so I'll pull the numbers up here. Uh, for the past 12 months, it was $178. So if one of your primary inputs have, has doubled, what would that do to your economics as a business? What about events that are over $500? These are occurring 9% of the hours in the past year. Well, it represents one third of your spend. So if you have flexibility in your operations and you say, hey, I only have 60, 70% uptime, well, what can you do with that to address price? Or what can you do if you want to have battery technology or a not gas generator on the backside to capture price arbitrage? You know about those events and uh, events you can take a corrective action to mitigate the impact. The next would be a coincident peak. This is essentially uh, looking at load, and you're looking for the highest period of demand in a defined time interval. In Alberta, it's once a month, so we have a 12 cent growth. If you want to know the impact of that, if you hit every single one, it's an additional $126,000 per megawatt year. Now, we can continue to build new peaker plants to help when demand is at the high. One of the other activities which is occurring is demand response. This is a low balancing activity. So if you're an operator at a steady load, you can get paid to be on call. Last year, there were about 17 calls for 15 minutes. So in about three hours, if you had one megawatt, you'd save almost a half million dollars. I'm saying save, you get paid. 450,000. So this is actually a revenue generating activity. Just to say, hey, I'm available and I can shut down for 15 minutes when we need it. Now, when you do these activities, you can't do them at the same time. You have to optimize and choose what strategy. This is where we come in. We provide the forecast, 
you provide an optimizer so that instead of chasing one strategy because they'll cancel each other out often, we'll provide a co-optimized cool solution. And now, because carbon is becoming a more present figure, we're seeing uh, more demand for carbon stream. Uh, so this is car our carbon stream product within the energy stream uh, ecosystem. We'll start off on the chart on the right. Right now, the standard is a static figure for how you measure carbon. We're a little better than that. With pushing technology, we are actually able, on the left, uh, to map the carbon intensity of the grid at a specific time. We're now working on forecasting. So the end goal is to provide an ecosystem where you have all energy cost elements that you have under your control so that you can make the right decision. We have some partners who are now looking at the carbon stream product to say, listen, I'm prioritizing ESG over economics. These are very healthy businesses. And how they're looking at this is they're saying, well, can I charge my battery when prices are low and the grid has lower carbon intensity? and then consume that battery to offset high prices with high carbon intensity. So we're really starting to scratch the surface on the applicability of this area. And why does this matter? Well, if you look at all the green, this is the standard uh, as the top line, and the green represents where you would be overcommitting or overpaying on a carbon tax. Well, when we, and just for detail, it's 0.6 to 0.1 for the max min. Well, 2031, you're seeing 170 dollars per ton of CO2, uh, with the max of 0.6, that's 102 uh, versus 0.1 of 17. So once again, it's a factor of almost five. So if you can reduce your exposure on a carbon tax by choosing when you're operating, you can really sweeten your economics. All right, we jumped slides, but we're getting into more of the use cases. Before that, I want to start off with another aspect of our philosophy from our approach essentially cut the BS that you're working with an end user. Often, the end user of your product is not in a boardroom. It's not a person running a strategy or IT. It's someone in an operations room. We can use a lot of fancy words. We can talk about A, A, you know, accuracy, precision, recall. We're going to confuse people. You want to identify what factor or what metric your partner will make a decision on. You want to simplify your communication. You want to um, you know, understand how that true user will use it and then provide a very simple use case for them. If you can automate it to the person, it's going to be even more successful. Because when you see projects fail, it's because we're overcomplicating it. The end user wants something simple that uh, can tell them directionally how they need to change the behavior. Because if you walk in and someone just cares about a high price event, I will essentially shut my plant down and slow my plant down. When prices get above $100 a megawatt hour, when you walk in talking about late, they're unrelated. Me not scoopers and Eric doesn't relate. Really, you know, I maybe care a bit more about accuracy, precision, recall. Mostly recall, depending if, you know, I just want to know when this event is happening. Or if I don't mind, you know, having some high cost events, I want to be a bit more strategic when I shut off, it's precision. We'll tie this in to a couple of these cases. But the big message, be specific, be simple, and you'll see better adoption to the end market. So overall, when we're going through the use case, this is some of our guidance for an energy response plan. What do you need to do? You have to prepare, you identify what you're going to do, you have to find it, and you'll train it. Ultimately, with these things, it's not something you snap your finger on, but it turns it into a daily practice. So I remember 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was in oil and gas, we talked about safety, people laughed at it, this is never going to stay. Now safety is one of the first things people talk about. Our partners, body midstream, upstream, any other sectors, energy is now part of their daily ops conversation. Just as they're talking about safety, they'll now go into energy and say, if we see these market events, we will implement some ERP. So now this is something that they're cognizant of and working with. From that, our notifications come up. We do load forecasting, uh, load forecasting for 14 days. Coincident peak forecasting for six. Our price forecast goes out uh, six days. Uh, and then demand response is more of a real time activity that we optimize, but we allow you to plan for you. Uh, now, ultimately, whenever any of these events happen, 
you have to implement the plan, and then you restore it. A lot of you know partners before they had us, they responded to a real-time price, and then we asked, okay, so you're you grant the hour, a thousand dollar hour. When do you turn on? Well, we don't really know. We'll follow along and then flip on when we feel it's right. Often you're hitting another high price event, or their behavior can actually change the market and have a coincident peak occur. With those with foresight, they are often putting themselves in a dangerous bond when they're trying to respond. So one of the cases I'd like to highlight, this is an Alberta company. Uh, their manufacturing is deal with an electric current furnace. So essentially they stick three cathodes in a vessel with scrap metal and then blast the heck of a little bit with electricity, 52 megawatts. So with this, we did a bit of an audit on their site. They could shut down the electric arc burns, the ladle, uh, subside infrastructure, overall 92% reduction in uh, load. With this, the annual savings last year were 5.5 million, and they had about a 2,000% ROI. Now, this was from a simple change in their behavior where our forecast goes through an API to a connector where they then schedule their production. This is for a natural gas generator. So once again, we saw price was going all over the place, right? Well, in this case, the partner wants to run a natural gas generator. They want to be attentive to carbon, and they want to use us to choose when they're firing the generator off. So overall, on this, this is just at the proof of concept phase. Uh, we're upgrading the infrastructure now for the nat gas generator, uh, but the forecast on this will be an 8,000% ROI for you. Or 800. You know, these, these are pretty big numbers, but it's because these are often very simple solutions that can have a meaningful impact. So, little changes in behavior can be very meaningful in a, in a defined space. Crypto. Uh, this is another one, very applicable. So, this is a map of our algorithm. So, how are we looking at it? We're looking at clicks and peaks. Are these apparent? Yes, no. If yes, that's all. Value is marketing. We're then looking at what the hourly price forecast is, the next 15 minute increment. From that, we can shut them off. Ultimately, we ensure that they only mine an economic coin depending on their strategy. Then, ERS directed that's a subset of DR. They can get paid when they're online. So, they actually pay for our services by the load balancing activity they're doing. This is on a 100 megawatt facility. Their plan is to go up to 500 megawatts. Uh, this is in Texas, and when they Say Texas, everything is bigger. It's true. Uh, you know, we support a couple of crypto miners in Alberta. They're about 20 million. So this really talks about the scale. Model performance. You know, we have to be transparent. We have to show where we're strong. We have to show where we're weak. Uh, this is our price forecast. We're looking at the Alberta market. Seventy-five dollars to four hundred. Many of our industrial partners are changing the behavior between one hundred and fifty and four hundred. Uh, we have accuracy up here. Uh, when we look at the three day ahead, that's our ninety-six uh, hour, uh, our last position. So overall, we see exceptionally strong accuracy uh, metrics when we look at F one uh, three call precision. Uh, we're typically seen in the high sixties, seventies, even up to the eighties. Uh, so overall, this is supporting large industries. Uh, many of the Canadian pipelines are using our uh, price forecast and close and peak forecast for pump power optimization. We're seeing uh, large operators planning facilities for when they're going to be firing certain assets on. These tools are available and very applicable, but often it requires innovative minds that we have to, uh, here today to actually challenge the status quo and say, we can do better. Uh, this is a map, uh, a time zero plot. For a price forecast, full price uh, in green, that's the actual or four hour to current day. So, uh, partners using this to identify $400 events that uh, continue for four hours. Uh, we identified 30 events, we got uh, approximately 90% of them. Uh, so, they use this forecast to essentially plan their daily operations. So, once again, if you have a foresight, how can you change your behavior? It's market costs. Historically, a lot of focus was put on repair and maintenance, asset optimization for production maximization. To me, Nirvana is when we look to the market, we look internal, and we're optimizing both factors, not just optimizing to one node or the other. 
Uh, once again, this is uh, a loan forecast, so uh, a different company, they plan the production schedule a week in advance. So with this, they want to understand how strong our forecasts are starting Monday morning. Why? That's the business need. This is an area where I feel the is a great measure. We're looking at the loan forecast to identify the key. We find them, uh, we got 12 out of 12, uh, so 12 months at 12 months, where we were successfully calling this at the beginning. Uh, overall, at the beginning of the week, when we look at an eight, we're tracking 3% versus the event, and we get to the day of, uh, you know, for the one hour uh, of the event, we were 0.6, uh, and then 0.5 for the day. So we have a systematic model that we have mapped. Uh, starting in Alberta from Lynch, Ontario, we're doing Texas right now. Auction right here is doing PJM on the East Coast. Uh, by the end of the year, we expect to be in at least two more U.S. markets. We want to be the energy provider, that's towards North America, North American energy optimization. Uh, with that, uh, sort of track record for CP since uh, 2017, we've been doing it here for a while. But with that, I'd like to open it up for questions.